Welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that really will spend weeks looking for the best compost bin option. You have no idea how many reviews I will read. <laughs> I'm your host, Amanda, and this is episode 199. And this is part one in a recurring series examining and debunking the most common, I don't know, excuses and like even justifications we see for supporting and maybe even, I don't know, protecting fast fashion and fast everything. Uh, This week, we're going to get started with a real banger. There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. And note that I said recurring series. So this series will return here and there with other episodes in between. And I'm sure... As time passes, we'll have even more sort of excuses to debunk here on Clothes Horse. So this, I don't know, this series could go on for a really long time. (laughs) But first, I want to remind you that this is episode 199, which means the Clothes Horse 200th episode extravaganza is only a few days away. It's happening this Thursday April 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. I'll share the link in the show notes that you can sort of save to access later, Um, but I'll also be sharing that link throughout the week. And if you follow Close Horse on YouTube, you will see it there as well. I'm really excited. We have some really special stuff planned for you. And we have a special guest from the past who will be there to respond to your comments and questions and kind of generally help keep the show running. So, I hope that I will see you there this Thursday at 8 p.m. on YouTube. All right, I'm going to preface this all by saying, as always, that we are not here to fight with people in the comments section. We are not here to fight with people, period. There's no such thing as winning or losing or being victorious or converting people or any conversation like that. We're not here to make people feel bad or wrong or shame them, what we are here to do is share information, lead with compassion, and educate others. I have to ask you a question, and I want you to answer it honestly. Even if the challenge of knowing the answer feels embarrassing to have, okay? So here's my question for you. Where did the statement, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, begin? Make your best guess. Giving you a moment here. Okay. I'll tell you that I assumed that the source was like Karl Marx or some other big thinker in the world of communism, socialism, and just like critique of capitalism. But Karl Marx specifically was responsible for such bangers as workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains, and religion is the opium of the masses. You think about it, for a man who lived in the 1800s, he really, really knew what people would want to comment on Reddit. (laughs) He really did. I sometimes will think about going back in time and just trying to explain to people from even the early 1900s, Reddit or Instagram, like how it works. Like, it's okay. So like, well, maybe you don't even know what a telephone is, but it's this thing you talk into and you can talk to and hear someone who's somewhere else far away. And okay, but like beyond that, what if you could also not only talk to people on it, but you could also take pictures with it? Yeah, I don't know if you know about pictures, but like, you know, not paintings, but like photographs. Anyway, the other thing about these phones that also take pictures is that uh, you can also get the internet because they're kind of like computer computers. Yeah. Imagine explaining that all to someone and then being like, and then you want to crop it into a square and write a caption, but you want to include keywords that'll get picked up in the SEO for it. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) Karl Marx though, man, a guy who, if he were living right now, would be making the best memes and would be so famous on like Twitter or X or whatever people call it now. But seriously, I 
definitely thought that perhaps I had missed that day in class where the, when the professor had scrawled, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism across the dry erase board in the lecture hall before breaking down how and why we would, in an even more dystopic future, use that phrase to defend our Sheehan halls and our enormous Timu orders and so many other things that we would buy in excess, that some of us might even use it to justify a whole new quasi-disposable wardrobe for Coachella, that people in the comments section on Instagram might take it one step further And maybe they also learned this in that day that I missed class to say, how dare you speak out against fast fashion when you're posting this from your iPhone? I really thought the origin was some like big, big thinker, some Karl Marx type guy, if not Karl Marx himself. And perhaps you thought the same thing. It has, it has that feeling, right? It, it's, it's so bold and expansive, but also depressing, but also so real and so good at shutting people down when they're trying to tell you otherwise, right? Well, what if I told you that the phrase, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, began at the intersection of two things I spend a lot of time thinking about, social media and the commodification of feminism. You know I love to talk about feminist teas, so imagine my delight as I'm working on this episode about there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Imagine my delight in finding as I was doing that research that I could once again talk about feminist teas. <laughs> Every day is truly a gift sometimes, you know? Okay, so I want you to picture it. It's November 2014, just about six months after Sophia Amoruso's book, Girl Boss, was published. And girl bosses are bossing all over the place. We've got Thinks and Away and Glossier and Nasty Gal, these women-led brands taking the internet by storm. I'm pretty sure at this point, I had my first interview at Nasty Gal. And at that moment, I was working at ModCloth in LA. And I was loving this girl boss stuff. Even if I wasn't totally convinced on it, I was like, wow, it is unfair that I don't get to be a boss just because people think I'm a girl. You know, so I was in it too, okay? Well, it isn't just me that's feeling that way, and it isn't just all the people who read Girl Boss that are feeling that way. Retailers are starting to see that feminism is a big, big moneymaker. And surprisingly or not, it would become an even bigger moneymaker when Trump became president in 2017. But this is 2014, a simpler time, when we could brunch all day and pretend that everything was just fine. It is a great time for some commodified feminism. Well, UK brand Whistles, that's really the name, wanted to get in on the game. Okay, so I did want to tell you that I was like Whistles. I'm familiar with this this company. It comes up a lot in conversations about UK fast fashion. I went over and took a look at their Wikipedia page, which there's not much really there. And I'm not going to bore you with facts and figures about the company's growth. But I do want to read this paragraph. (laughs) It's not even a paragraph. I guess it's a paragraph. Never mind. It is a paragraph. Uh, Under the product section of the Whistles Wikipedia page. In the past, the style of Whistles was described as having a pretty but decidedly yummy mummyish air. Since Shepardson's appointment as chief executive, the clothes were said to have cleaner silhouettes with a more sophisticated palette. Baby pinks and lilacs have made way for olives, camel, china blue, tea rose, and yes, plenty of black. And the detailing has a quirky vintage feel rather than being fussy. This is from an article uh, called Bells and Whistles, uh, written by Carola Long in The Independent in 2008. Uh, I just had to, I've never been able to say yummy mummy on Clothes Horse, never really had the opportunity. Um, That's the main reason I wanted to read you that paragraph. And if that's all you take away from it, that was great. And we'll probably hopefully never say the phrase yummy mummy on this podcast again. Let's, Let's promise that to one another, okay? Anyway, so Whistles, not a store for yummy mummies anymore, much more sophisticated. Well, 
Whistles wants to get in on this commodification of feminism. Surely many people within the organization had read Girl Boss and they were ready. They were ready to girl boss their way to some feminist profits. So Whistles worked with Harry Potter star Emma Watson and some UK politicians, including Edward Miliband and Harriet Harman, to promote a line of teas that said, this is what a feminist looks like. The t-shirts were designed by Elle magazine and sold by Whistles, with all proceeds going to the Fawcett Society, a UK women's rights group. And these t-shirts are exactly what you imagine they will be. I will share a link to it in the show notes. Um, You know, white, they say in handwriting-esque font, this is what a feminist looks like. Uh, They retailed for 45 pounds, which is about 60 US dollars, give or take a little bit there. And I think, you know, honestly, like, I think Whistles probably would have sold out of these teas, maybe gotten some new customers who really loved Emma Watson, and then everyone would have forgotten it. Certainly, Whistles never expected that they would be a key part of creating the internet's new favorite catchphrase for defending, you know, Funko Pops and Squishmallow collections. But what happened next is that the Daily Mail, which, by the way, Daily Mail, not really known for its concern about women's rights, perhaps best demonstrated by its page three topless models. I have read that in recent years, they've been clothing the topless models more. But I mean, this is not, you know, a feminist publication. This is not Ms. Magazine. Um, The Daily Mail, however, published an expose outing whistles as having used sweatshop labor to make the t-shirts. The headline blared, 62 pence an hour, what women sleeping 16 to a room get paid to make Ed and Harriet's 45 pound, this is what a feminist looks like t-shirts. And by the way, 62 pence is about 77 cents in US dollars. So horrible, right? To hear, here's a feminist tea, you know, ostensibly some sort of fundraiser for women's rights and just generally a big statement in support of women uh, and the people making it are getting paid 77 cents an hour. Now, to me here with the glorious gift of hindsight that one can have in 2024, I'm like, yeah, of course those teas were made by women who weren't being paid and were overworked and not working in great conditions, just as all of the feminist teas before and after it, right? Like this is not surprising to us, but this is 2014. This is a simpler time, even if it's only in that there weren't as many feminist teas out there. And so many of these like give back program, charity tea, fundraiser, nonsense, you know, ethical washing scams, right? Like this is still kind of new. So what's the story of these teas in terms of how they were made? Well, they were made in a factory in the Indian Ocean island of Mauritius. I was looking up information about Mauritius because it's one of those countries I remember from geography, but I couldn't exactly place. And it's to the east of Africa. And like I said, it's an island nation. Wikipedia says... Mauritius is known for its beaches, lagoons, and reefs. The mountainous interior includes Black River Gorges National Park with rainforests, waterfalls, hiking trails, and wildlife like the flying fox. I looked at photos, and it looks like an actual paradise. And you would ask yourself, why is anyone making any kind of clothing here, much less some silly, you know, so-called feminist tea. Like, how is this happening in this beautiful island paradise? Well, clothing production became a thing in Mauritius in the 1970s when foreign investors, primarily from Hong Kong, began investing in clothing manufacturing facilities in Mauritius. I'm going to level with you. I'm sure it's that they saw an opportunity to manufacture cheaply, right? To pay people as little money as possible to make clothing because here was a country where that industry did not exist, where there weren't a lot of job options. And it, you know, it was going to be easy. It was going to be easy to get cheap labor that would be committed to learning the skills to sew these clothes. And the women who, you know, were primarily who these new factories started by these foreign investors, 
The women were excited to work in the factories because it was an improvement over their other primary employment opportunity, which was working on the sugar plantations. In the factories, they only had to work eight hours a day versus 12 on the plantations, and they were paid slightly more for their work, not a ton, but enough for working in one of these clothing manufacturing facilities to feel fancy, right? To feel like you were a little bit like higher level class, you know, because you worked there instead of in the plantation. So it was a desirable job. And for the first part of the 1970s, the clothing industry grew in Mauritius. In 1975, the country signed on to a trade deal that made importing and exporting to Europe duty-free, making the island more appealing to European and UK clothing brands. But the sluggish global economy in the late 1970s kind of slowed down growth. But still, factories were running, they were making stuff, they were exporting it around the world, and they were creating this highly skilled workforce who could make clothing. The industry began to change in the 1980s when those original Hong Kong investors realized And this is the story of the apparel industry, the global apparel industry, like time and time again, right? These original Hong Kong investors realized that it was cheaper to do clothing production in China and Taiwan. So slowly they began to pull out of Mauritius. Now this pullout would take a couple of decades, but it began in a pretty significant way in the 1980s. And Those who would pull out, those investors that left Mauritius would actually leave behind all of their production equipment and this highly skilled workforce. So domestic investors, you know, people who actually lived in Mauritius and had the wealth, they swooped in and kept the factories running, finding new sources of business. It helped that a civil war in Sri Lanka forced brands to shift their production out of that country and over to Mauritius. And so that kept the garment industry chugging along in the 1980s. In the 90s, even more Hong Kong investors moved out as they found that labor was much cheaper in Vietnam and China. Yet the industry continued to grow, making clothing for countries throughout the global north, including the United States, reaching its peak employment in 1999. In fact, At that point, factories in Mauritius were receiving so many orders that they had to outsource some of that work to Madagascar, where the labor was even cheaper. I want you to put a pin in that, okay? Because basically what was happening is the people working in the factories in Mauritius were going to Madagascar and training these workers in how to make garments, in, you know, bringing the equipment, investing in the equipment, opening the factories there, really to keep the the work flowing into Mauritius, right? So it was sort of like they were subcontracting to Madagascar. At the same time, Mauritius was putting more and more focus on tourism as it saw more visitors from the global north visiting the island paradise. And, you know, tourism can be really lucrative. More garment workers actually made the shift into tourism-related jobs, forcing the clothing factories to bring workers into Mauritius from Madagascar, Sri Lanka, and even China. So now they're importing work because really what's happening here is the garment manufacturing industry was able to recruit workers early on because the only other work option really was working on these sugar plantations, right? But now... There are many other job options as tourism becomes bigger and bigger. You could work in a restaurant, you could work in a hotel, you could sell souvenirs, you could open your own small business and on and on and on. And many of these jobs were far more desirable than sewing clothes all day, right? Which takes a toll on you physically and probably mentally as well. So now they're bringing in workers to make it happen, right, to get these clothes made. And they're still outsourcing work to Madagascar, where the labor is even cheaper. So actually, it's kind of in the best interest of these factory owners to outsource as much work as possible to Madagascar because it's more profitable. Well, in the 2000s, the garment industry began to collapse in Mauritius due to several factors. And the biggest ones being exclusion from some key trade agreements, which resulted in a huge decrease in exports to the U.S., and 
a loss of business to even cheaper places to do production like Madagascar, right? They had outsourced the work there. And to do that, they had trained the workers, built the factories, invested in the equipment. And now the work was just going directly to Madagascar. The last remaining Hong Kong investors who had started throwing money into the burgeoning garment industry in Mauritius in the 70s, they were now pulling out completely to the point that they were literally giving the factories to the locals, just being like, hey, do what you want with it, bye. They'd already profited, made back all their money many times over in the past you know, 30 years. There were still billions of dollars worth of clothing being made in Mauritius, but thanks to the pressure to compete with the lower prices offered by countries like Madagascar and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh, most factories were on the verge of bankruptcy by 2007. The industry somewhat recovered, and it continues today. There are a lot of garment factories on the island, even right now today as I'm recording this in 2024. But... For the sake of what we're talking about today, as in the origin of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism and the story of these feminist teas, we have to remember that we're in 2014 and clothes are still being made here in Mauritius, including this is what a feminist looks like teas for whistles. No doubt at this point in time, any factory that's still making clothing in Mauritius is offering very low prices in order to remain competitive because in 2014, prices are being pushed lower and lower as investors build factories in countries that have a lower minimum wage and less oversight of worker working conditions, right? So to be competitive... <laughs> In 2014, and honestly, right now in 2024, in clothing production, you have to be paying as little as possible to your workers. So nothing about this Daily Mail expose shocks me. We'll talk a little bit about what they said in it, but like, I also am coming at it with the hindsight of 2024, when we know that this is, in a large way, many of us know that this is how it works, right? So according to the writer, Workers in the Mauritius factory were being paid about $150 a month. It would take them about two weeks of work to afford one of those feminist teas for themselves. The women slept in 20 square feet dormitory rooms filled with eight bunk beds intended to house 16 workers each night. They worked a minimum of 45 hours each week with the possibility of overtime. This particular factory, which also made clothing for Topshop and Urban Outfitters, had been under fire in 2007 when a different expose had revealed that workers making clothing for Kate Moss's Topshop line were being paid about $5 a day. In fact, skilled workers from other countries had been lured to Mauritius to work in this factory with the promise of making a much higher wage. Then when they were there and they started working, they found they were going to be paid a much lower wage. <laughs> Classic bait and switch here. And then they're trapped. They can't afford to go home. And so they have no choice but to take this, right? So there they are. They're being paid about $5 a day. On top of that, workers of different nationalities and genders were being paid different wages for the same work. Now, this Daily Mail article about the feminist tees interviews the owner of this factory, and he said that things had changed quite a bit since that whole episode in 2007, with everyone being paid equally. Yet here we were again, workers being paid about five-ish dollars a day for their work. So naturally, many people, and I mean people on the internet, had a lot to say about this. I'm sure I had a lot to say about this. After all, what's the point of wearing a feminist tee if the women making it are being underpaid, overworked, and living in terrible conditions? How feminist is it to wear a tee made by exploited women? This is a conversation we've had many times here on Close Horse, and I'm sure you've had many times with your friends. But we have to remember, this is 2014. This is one of the first times this conversation is being had. And interestingly enough, fast fashion brands of all types 
will churn out feminist t-shirts for the next five or six years, all being made under similar circumstances. Like, this isn't the last time this happens. It doesn't deter Forever 21 from making a feminist collection, you know? It still keeps going because I think while a lot of people had a lot to say about this on the internet, one, people forget, and two, what we often think of as a a lot of people, and that's in quotes, talking about it on the internet, actually turns out to be a very small sampling of the population as a whole. So while a decent amount of people learned from this situation that perhaps your feminist tea isn't made under feminist conditions, the majority of people did not know anything about that. And that's something I try to remind myself of all the time as a you know chronically online person, that what I know, the conversations I see happening are generally not representative of society as a whole. And I would urge you to take that realization to heart and it might may sometimes actually soothe your anxiety to know that what you're seeing people say a lot on the internet that is upsetting you or making you scared about the future may not be ge- how the general population feels or is going to vote or anything else. So just that's where I find comfort sometimes, and I would urge you to do the same. But anyway, here we are. It's 2014, and we've all had the mind-blowing realization that feminist teas are made by exploiting women, right? Like a lot of social media discourse, the pendulum swung hard into serious black and white thinking. It also it started with that whole very sound idea of that, like I said, of why wear a feminist tea if it was made by exploiting women. That makes sense, still makes sense. Always something to remember, right? But it quickly turned, as these things can, it quickly turned to if you're buying anything anywhere and not ensuring that it was made ethically, meaning everyone was paid a living wage, then you're a bad person. And of course, we know that line of thinking is completely lacking in nuance. Like, what if you don't have any better shopping options? What if you don't have the privilege of time, access, and most importantly, money to buy only ethically made items? And also, there are certain trappings of modern life that are kind of non-negotiable for existing within our society, no matter how much we might hate them, that don't have truly ethical options. You know, phones, computers, routers, stoves and ovens, washing machines, furnaces, hot water heaters. I could go on and on, right? All of these have very murky supply chains, just like these feminist teas, Realizing that doesn't mean that we just give up, right? And we like start placing big Shein haul orders and, you know, buying tons of plastic just so we can throw it in the ocean. Of course not, right? But this is indicative of like understanding that things are more complicated than they might seem sometimes, right? We talk about that all the time here. And then another line of thinking was also popping up on social media in reaction to this whole feminist tea debacle. And this one was even less nuanced and more, I don't know, doomer in its vibe, let's just say. Basically, it was, if you buy or consume anything, then you are explicitly making the conscious decision to support exploitation. Ooh, that's not a heavy burden to bear at all, is it? I am going to tell you that I have literally seen people say that on Reddit, as if that is even a possible scenario in which, well, you know, you would never consume anything in your entire life. We know that this is some seriously flawed thinking, and it makes me think of the email episode from earlier this year, because to exist, to survive— We must consume food, water, clothing, shelter, education, healthcare. Beyond that, we need to enjoy life. We need entertainment. We need to see our friends. We need to have happy times, right? We need things to be more comfortable. We need to go places. We need to have heat. We need to have air conditioning sometimes. We need all kinds of things to exist and not even just exist, but also thrive. Shaming anyone anywhere about 
their need to consume is basically shaming them for being human. So here it is. We have people arguing on the internet saying like, hey, uh, if you're not buying the most ethical things out there, then you are a bad person. And we have another group of people saying, hey, if you buy or consume or use anything in your lifetime, then you're also a bad person. Putting an awful lot of responsibility on people who are just, you know, trying to live life. And here's the thing, to not consume anything ever in your lifetime, uh, that's a level of a privileged situation that I can't even understand because it means that somehow you are able to grow and produce all of your own food, clothing, machinery, cars. I have no idea. Just like literally everything exists within your like parcel of land that you own, I suppose. And you don't have to work for anyone else except to sustain yourself. Um, Or you are like wealthy enough to always be able to find and buy the most ethical version of everything. Like your clothes are being custom made for you by someone who is always paid a living wage and I guess somehow is found the fabric to make your clothes from someone who was paid a living wage to create it. And all of your food is ethically grown and sourced and everything in your life. I guess you have some special smartphone that was ethically created. And really like what we're doing here is we're setting the bar super high for everyone on earth that like they have all of these privileges that don't even actually fully exist. And so it just creates this perfect storm of like every human should feel bad about existing and needing things, but I guess maybe someone gets to feel superior by telling those people that they should feel bad. I don't know. This is how the internet works sometimes, this like internet logic where everyone loses, but someone gets to feel like a winner just for saying it. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at Dylan Page Life and Style. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. 
Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. High Energy Vintage is a fun and funky vintage shop located in Somerville, Massachusetts, just a few minutes away from downtown Boston. They offer a highly curated selection of bright and colorful clothing and accessories from the 1940s to the 1990s for people of all genders. Husband and wife duo Wiley and Jessamy handpick each piece for quality and style with a focus on pieces that transcend trends and will find a home in your closet for many years to come. Come. In addition to clothing, the shop also features a large selection of vintage vinyl and old school video games. Find them on Instagram at High Energy Vintage, online at HighEnergyVintage.com, and at markets in and around Boston. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. And at this point, as people on the internet are like spiraling and and like finger pointing and shaming and blaming one another especially punching down on lower income people. Of course, that's where this always, always goes. Here's where the conversation of, well, there's no ethical, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, capitalism. Well, this is where the conversation of, well, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism came into play. It was intended to remind everyone that no matter where they bought it and how, I don't know, clean the supply chain was, There was no such thing as a perfect purchase of anything. There would always be an impact because consumption is never devoid of impact. Someone worked to make it happen. Resources were used. And if you get down to it, if you really want to get down to it, it seems unethical to use the water or air that would seemingly belong to all of us to make things that are then sold to us, right? I mean, like at its core, This is not ethical, right? Once again, this doesn't mean that we just start making things out of plastic, buying them, and then throwing them in the ocean just for fun all day, every day, because we give up and the world is about to end and there's nothing good that can ever happen. And we just spiral with doomerism until, I don't know, we throw up. I'm not really sure, but that's not what this means, right? It means recognizing this, right? Recognizing that this is a flawed system down to its core and then kind of sitting with it. The intention of this recognition isn't to give everyone a free pass at Sheehan Halls. At the point when there's no ethical consumption under capitalism sort of birthed itself onto Twitter and Tumblr and became a conversation topic, it was intended in good faith to remind everyone that it was really fucked up and privileged to pass judgment on those who, I don't know, bought clothes at Walmart or they bought the regular not organic bananas or drove an old car instead of a Prius because that's what they could afford and that's what they had access to. 
It was intended to be a recognition that for many people, the most ethical and sustainable option is what they can afford, not the one with all the certifications attached to it. And here's the thing. It also meant that those who had the privilege of time, money, and access should make the most ethical choice available to them as often as possible. Maybe it wouldn't always be possible, but they should try to do their best to make the most ethical choice. The other thing about the original intention of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism is recognizing that we can't shop our way to a better future or a better world or really a better anything. That a better world where workers are paid a living wage and work under good conditions, where resources aren't wasted, where products are better and longer lasting and fit us and make us feel good and we get lots of use out of them. All of those things meant that all of us needed to get involved in fighting for change by voting, protesting when possible, having conversations with others, and letting our elected representatives know that we wanted better regulation of all of these industries, and even maybe running for office. In other words, nothing gets better if we don't get involved. And rather than there's no ethical consumption under capitalism being I don't know, permission to opt out, to give up, to sort of just say, hey, it is what it is. I got to enjoy my own life. Rather, it was calling people in to do what they could, to work together, to change what's happening. But somewhere along the line, the way people interpreted that statement, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, Somewhere along the way, it became a reason, a rallying cry for giving up. But back to the origins of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. You've probably noticed that I haven't attributed the first use of that saying to one specific person, and that's because no one seems to know who said it first, but many internet historians on Reddit and other places seem to agree that it originated in the anti-capitalism corner of Tumblr around 2014 following the feminist tea debacle. From there, it spread across all the social media platforms. It kind of got memefied in a pretty major way. And now we find it popping up in posts about fast fashion, electronics, Netflix subscriptions, and so much more. Often used as either an excuse or a bitter proclamation of the futility of life and the certain doom of society. Yeah, MBD, right? Just everything being horrible. One last thing about the feminist t-shirt debacle. A few days after the Daily Mail article, the Fawcett Society, the benefactor of the sales of those t-shirts, made a statement. Quote, we are pleased to confirm that we have today seen expansive and current evidence from whistles that the CMT factory in Mauritius that they use to produce our this is what a feminist looks like t-shirt conforms to ethical standards. And that statement was made by Eva Neitzert, who was the deputy chief executive of the Fawcett Society. Neitzert said, we have been particularly pleased to receive evidence that 100% of workers are paid above the government mandated minimum wage and all workers are paid according to their skills and years of service. The standard working week is 45 hours and workers are compensated at a higher rate of pay for any overtime worked. Furthermore, the factory work employees were free to join a union, and there was even a strong union presence within the facility. Both the pay and the working conditions were not only in line with Mauritian law, they were in line with the Ethical Trading Initiative base code. Even labor behind the label said the factory seemed fine. But yet, you have to admit, it's a, it's a depressing story. It seems wrong. It feels wrong. It is wrong that feminist tees could sell for $70 with the people making them making $5 a day, right? Like it feels wrong because it is wrong, regardless of what the law says. 
Maya Forstater is a researcher and writer in the realm of economic development, and she wrote about the t-shirt debacle on her blog back then in 2014. I'll share the post in the show notes for you to check it out. There's a lot to think about there. She said something that really struck me. She wrote, low wages and communal dorms may be an unpalatable contrast to the t-shirt's empowerment message, inflated price tag, and celebrity endorsement. But the reality is that the work on this unglamorous side of the fashion industry has been a way out of poverty for many millions of women and men, and a first rung towards industrial development for many countries. And I have to say, this is all true. Does that does that mean it's cool that people have to work so hard for so little money? Definitely not. And why does a low paying job with super long hours that takes a great physical toll in your body have to be the only way that someone can somewhat succeed or at least exist within capitalism? Is that ethical? And most likely, Mauritius is keeping its minimum wage low so that it doesn't lose more manufacturing jobs to places with even lower minimum wages. I mean, it's it's already seen that happen. And there are countries like Bangladesh that are even cheaper for manufacturing, right? Ultimately, people stay poor in these countries because there is so much fear of losing even the option of these low-paying, difficult jobs to another country that will do them for even less money and protect their employees even less. And yes, it is super unfair that workers can get paid 77 cents for making a t-shirt that will sell for 60 to $70, and that no one involved in making, selling, or shipping that shirt will ever get a fair share of the selling price, while those at the top will take most of that money for themselves. In fact, the fast fashion system, just like most industries, only works for those people at the top when people stay poor and hungry for work even when that means keeping entire countries poor and hungry for work. This is a broken system for everyone except the wealthiest. And when you see this illustrated so plainly in a situation like this, you can see how there really is no truly ethical consumption under capitalism. But that doesn't mean we give up completely. That doesn't mean we guilt ourselves about needing things. It doesn't mean we take the bleak view that the world is fucked and unfixable and that we should just keep making Shein hauls until the world ends. Because we have the power to make it better, no matter how overwhelming it all seems. Okay, let's take a minute to talk about how we can make more ethical decisions, even though we know that none of them will ever be perfect. Remember, it is progress, not perfection. We cannot let looking for the perfect option be the enemy of progress. Thanks to the systems around us, this is hard, right? I have my sort of... I don't know, like mental flow chart for how I make purchases. I'll start with like, okay, here's a thing that I need. Can I find it secondhand? I can't. Okay. Can I find it from a small business? Can I find it from a local small business? And no matter where I bought it, if I ended up having to buy it from a big box or Amazon or what have you, how can I make it last as long as possible? And what will I do when I no longer need it? You know, that's when I'm going to mindfully rehome it. I'm not going to dump it in the trash. I'm not going to dump it in the Goodwill bin. I'm actually going to try to find a home for it where it will be used by someone else, whether that is using my local buy nothing group, maybe Facebook marketplace, seeing if one of my friends or neighbors or family members want it. I will do everything I can to find another home for it. And in fact, Every time I buy something new, except for maybe like underwear, because that would be kind of weird, I'm actually thinking about who will have it next after me so I can ensure that I care for it 
with laundry and mending and everything else so that it is still in great condition should I give it to someone else someday. I'm always thinking about where it goes next and that where it goes in most cases would not be the trash bin. You know, here's some examples, right? Because I think it's one thing for me to list these out, but like, how, how do I put it in practice? So, you know, we moved into this new house and you know how it is when you move, especially if you've moved across country or you moved to just a completely different place, you need to buy things that are like really unfun, but necessary. And one thing we needed was a big metal compost bin. Like I'd done a lot of research into the best kind of bin for the climate that we live in, you know, and I wanted to be composting all of our food waste so that I could go into the garden. And I found the one I wanted. Well, guess what? I did believe that there was possibly a chance that someone would be selling this compost bin secondhand, you know, like on Facebook Marketplace. They were not. And to be fair, that would be kind of gross, <laughs> but I was willing to do it because um, compost bins are kind of gross. Um, so after that, I was like, okay, well, I know the compost bin that I want because there are not that many types out there. I wanted this metal one that has holes, has a lid. It's pretty large. Um, you can't turn it, but you can use a shovel to mix it up and it ensures that like none of the bacteria in there get overheated, which can happen in a plastic one. Anyway, I did all the reading, right? So I knew the one I wanted. So I thought, okay, I can see very clearly that like Home Depot and Lowe's and all these big box stores sell it. Is there someone locally who sells it? And I found a hardware store right up the road that is locally owned. You know, it supports the local fire department. The owners live here in the community. Obviously, all the employees live here in the community. And I bought it there. Now, did that the hardware store make this? No, right? They did not manufacture the compost bin. The same company that's making them for Home Depot and everybody else, they all, it's all the same compost bin. But the money I spend here locally is going to have more of a local impact, right, on our actual immediate community. I mean, they're giving money to the volunteer fire department, among other things. Uh, that's way more impactful than if I bought it from Home Depot. And so there you go. I made the most ethical choice I could based on the options. And you don't get a more, I don't know, a more opaque supply chain than buying a compost bin. Like, I don't know anything about where it was made, right? But this was the best decision I could make. That's one example. You know, recently, you know, one of the questions I get most often here is where to buy underwear. And this has been uh, a struggle for me. I had not bought new underwear since about 2017 because I just could not figure out where to buy underwear that I liked that were the style I wanted, that I would w get a lot of wear out of, and that wouldn't be a totally shitty company, and that I could afford. And I did a lot of research over years, and I reached this point this year where literally like all of my underwear were falling apart. They were not repairable. All the elastic was shot. They had holes in them. They were falling down while I was walking up the street, like just a nightmare. I, I was like, okay, it's fine. I'm going to get seven new pairs of underwear. That's a week of supply. As long as they do laundry every week, that's just a fine amount of underwear. And I ended up buying them from The Gap. And I'm going to tell you why. One, The Gap was one of the first companies to pay up after getting pressure from all of us to pay up. So I was like, okay, that's good. I knew I couldn't afford to buy seven pairs of underwear from a small maker. I just like, that's not the kind of budget I have at this point. And I also knew that there was no one locally making underwear. So fine, I'm going to buy them from the Gap. I'm going to buy only the amount I need. I am going to buy the exact style that I wanted, which I really wanted high waist black underwear. Sorry, I know this is a lot of information, but it's very specific to what I wanted because I hate when your underwear hits lower than the waist of your tights. It just is like a weird, uncomfortable scenario all day. And as a person who wears a dress in tights, almost every day except for summer, uh, when I just don't wear tights, but I do wear a dress, I knew I wanted high-waisted underwear. So I ultimately bought them from The Gap and I've been like hand washing them and line drying them so they'll last as long as possible. And ultimately I'm really happy with my purchase. And yeah, I wish I could have bought those seven pairs of underwear from someone cool who's making them at home, but you know, I just, I just can't afford that right now. So this was, this was the best option I could make. And I was like, you know, the gap, 
the Gap tries. They do better than a lot of other companies out there. Like I used to buy a lot of underwear from Aerie, well, back before 2017. And when American Eagle just like refused to pay up during the whole pay up stuff in 2020, I was like, okay, I guess I can never buy underwear from them ever again. And I stuck to it. So that's how I tried to make the most ethical decision possible in two different scenarios, both in things that I actually really needed and, you know, really thinking through the impact of it, minimizing my consumption and just trying to do the best that I could do. Um, and yeah, it feels really good to have new underwear after, I don't know, seven years. <laughs> Seriously. Here's the thing. When it came to both shopping for the underwear or the compost bin, I had privileges that made that easier, right? One is that I live in an area with a lot of small local businesses and great thrift stores and awesome Facebook marketplace. And I was able to look in those places, ultimately find someone local to buy the compost bin from. I would not have had that option in Austin. It was really, really hard to find small businesses there because they can't afford to exist within the city. And so it's all big boxes everywhere. So I feel very lucky that I now live in a place where shopping local is very convenient. I also have access to a car so I can go to these local businesses and shop from them. I have time to research compost bins in copious detail, along with searching for the perfect pair of high-waisted black underwear. And like I said, I have a lot less money now since I don't have a corporate job, but I can spend a few dollars more if I to buy something locally rather than trying to save five bucks from Home Depot or what have you. My advice for all of you is make the most ethical decisions you can based on your access and budget, right? And remember, it's not just about what you bought and where you bought it. It's how much you bought, what you didn't buy, and what else you do that makes you part of the slow fashion community. It's not just about shopping. It's about not shopping. It's about voting. It's about being there and supporting others and educating others. And you, everything you do is an important part of this. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be what feels right for you. If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles. By embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment, I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? 
Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand-dyed yarns, and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand-knit, crocheted, or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at the Pewter Thimble. Com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. Okay, now that we know the true origins and intentions behind the phrase, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, why do we see so many people using it in a way that differs from its original intention? Okay, so let's talk about, I know you've heard about this before, the post I did about Timu. Now, I've done it on Instagram, a lot of people saw it, a lot of people talked about it, but I posted it on TikTok and TikTok has showed it to close to half a million people at this point, which is like something that Instagram would never do. And while I'm excited that more people are seeing this information, it's also like, you know, it's, it was kind of stressful. I got a lot of comments, a lot of DMs. Not all of them were nice. Um, some of them were neutral. Some of them were great. But there was people who I wouldn't normally interact with showed up and they... They reacted differently in many different ways. I saw a lot of excuses in the comment section. And I say excuses, but these are just things that people say that I see over and over again that to me are a coping mechanism for this kind of information, right? Obviously, I saw a lot of people saying there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. 
I also saw things like, well, I'm poor and underpaid and inflation is bad and Timu is all I can afford. And I will say, if that's true, then keep doing what works best for you. Like I said earlier, make the most ethical decisions you can based on your access to these things and your budget. I see this a lot also in conversations about Shein and other fast fashion brands. And you know, you have to buy what you can afford to buy. That doesn't mean you need a whole haul or a new outfit every week or a closet just bursting at the seams with barely worn Shein clothing. But I do recognize that Shein offers a lot more size inclusivity than most of the sustainable ethical brands out there. I recognize that not everybody has access to great thrift stores. I recognize that a lot of people don't feel comfortable shopping online for secondhand clothing. I recognize all of this. And I understand that sometimes you just need something to wear for something specific, or you need new pants, or you have a new job and you have to dress a certain way or what have you. And sometimes the only place you can get what you need is Shein. That is fine. In fact, when you think about it, people who can't afford to do anything else or can't find their size or don't have access to other stuff and then shop from Shein or Timu, well, these comments are actually in line with the true meaning of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, meaning like people have to get what they can afford, right? And what they can find. And there's no shame in that. However, one way we can all work together to dismantle the fast fashion and fast everything system doesn't cost any money at all. And that is buying less stuff in the first place. What else can all of us do, no matter how much money we have or where we live or what size we wear in clothing? Well, We can make our stuff last longer by caring for it via laundry and mending. We can also all vote. We can email our representatives or even call them. We can share our knowledge with others. We can be a part of a community working together to make the world better, right? This is not some exclusive club for people who make a certain amount of money and wear a certain amount size and clothing and live in a certain place. This is for everyone. And the true intention behind there's no ethical consumption under capitalism actually aligns with our values, right? But bad faith use of it to just justify doomerism is not okay. Okay, another kind of excuse that I saw a lot was you know, what about ism? Well, what about prison labor? What about Nike? What about blank? Fill in something here. Sure, those things are all terrible too. And in fact, those things can be terrible at the same time as Timu. And just because there are other terrible things happening in the world doesn't mean we stop talking about Timu. We talk about all of them. We tell others what we know about them. We look for a list of companies that use prison labor within their supply chain, and we stop supporting them. We tell our friends about them. We also tell our friends about Timu, right? We organize together as a community to take a stand against prison labor or Timu or Nike's greenwashing or whatever it is. We call our senators to tell them we want legislation that bans prison labor for manufacturing products. We band together and we support the Fashion Act so companies like Nike and Shein and Timu have to do a better job of caring for the planet and its people. And so on and so on and so on. There is so much we can do even when we consider what about all these other things because What aboutism often feels like a diversion or some kind of gotcha moment, and maybe it sometimes is, but I think it's the function of people feeling overwhelmed by the sheer volume of injustices in this world. And it is up to us to give them that hope that we can change it, the hope that we already have, because like I said, we infect others with our hope, and I know infect grows verb. If you can think of a better one, send it my way. But we share that hope. How about that? With others, it breeds more hope. And that hope comes 
from community, from working together, for being aware of the impact we can have as a community. The other comment I saw a lot on my Timu post was, well, you typed your comment on an iPhone or you made this post on a computer, so you are a hypocrite. And I think this one is basically a repackaging of, you know, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but it's often used this one, I would say, as a gotcha moment to prove that the person talking about the issues with Timu or Shein, whatever, are actually hypocrites for owning a smartphone. It's not the gotcha that they that people think it is, okay? Because let's be real, Owning a smartphone isn't is kind of mandatory to function in society right now, to have a job, to stay in touch with your family and friends, etc. Right. And this one actually really falls into the there's no ethical consumption under capitalism when it's used correctly, because you know, it's true. Like to participate in this society, to be here, to get by, to survive in late stage capitalism, well. There are certain parts of it we have to lean into or we we don't get anything, right? And so it's not a gotcha moment. It just really reinforces the true meaning of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. But yes, the most frequent comment I saw under that post about Timu was, you know, Amazon and Nike are just as bad and that's because there's no ethical consumption under capitalism or whatever, there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, so I'm going to place a Timu order right now. Why do people say things like this? Like I said in the last episode about how to talk to others about slow fashion, understanding where these comments originate helps us reach those people and support them better. For one, this comes from a sense of feeling overwhelmed by all of the bad things happening in the world. It's kind of like a feeling of hopelessness about all of it. Like, how can I as one person do anything about this? And like I said before, that's where community comes in, helping people realize that they are not alone, that hope is out there, and that hope lives within all of us working together to change things. Sometimes these sorts of comments, especially, you know, no ethical consumption, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes they come from shock and guilt. Like, holy shit, I just placed a huge Timu order because my friend uses it and they said it was great. And now I find out it's bad. Well, no one wants to feel that way. No one wants to be complicit in the suffering of other humans. And we got to remember that shame and blame and guilt, they are never the way forward. Understanding that these sorts of excuses might stem from guilt or surprise or even a feeling of being tricked by Timu can help us see that those, those people aren't here to fight with us. They're just processing it all and they're frustrated and they're just tired of feeling like everything sucks, right? And that everyone... Every company is out there to take advantage of them and trick them. Also, plenty of people have heard and seen there's no ethical consumption under capitalism used so many times in bad faith across the internet that they take it as truth at its most literal meaning that it doesn't matter what we do, that it all sucks, so just do whatever. Because that's what it often means. That's how it often is used, right? It reminds me of a story I have told you many times over the past few years, and that's all about the K-Cups Facebook post, which if you haven't heard this before, great, you're in for a treat. Not really. If you have heard it before, just listen again. So basically, I belonged to a neighborhood group on Facebook when we lived in Philly, And I don't use Facebook that often. So even after we'd moved away from Philly, I would still occasionally receive notifications from it. And the random times I would log into Facebook, almost always to use Facebook Marketplace or look for yard sale listings, um, I would see posts from it. And one day there was a post where someone was like, man, it sucks. I just got a whole box of K-Cups delivered from Amazon and someone stole it off my porch and now I don't have any coffee and I don't know what to do. So If you don't know what a K-cup is, they're those little plastic disposable cups that you use a special coffee maker, call it a Keurig, to make a single cup of coffee at a time. And those K-cups are not recyclable. 
There's gazillions of them being used every year. There's a statistic that I can't remember now, but there was something like if every K-cup that had ever been used was stacked up, like in a line, it would wrap around the earth many times. Even the guy who invented K-cups is like sad about it now because he didn't mean it to be like a consumer product. He just wanted it for offices. It's the whole thing. But they're bad for the environment. And like, I don't know. I've used enough of them in hotel rooms over the years to say they don't make great coffee. And I am not a coffee snob. They make kind of gross coffee. And I now I see K-cups that make broth and tea and all kinds of other things. So it's like kind of out of control. Anyway, I was like, should I comment on this? That like K-cups are like not great for the environment. And then I was like, I don't get involved in Manta seriously. And also someone commented right immediately at the top, like, hey, you shouldn't use K-cups anyway. And here's why. And they shared all the stuff I just told you. And they were like, you know, I use a French press and it's like pretty cheap and easy. And, you know, I can tell you more about it if you want to. The next person shows up and says, ignore the person above me because the truth is your impact will never be as great as Amazon. So use all the K-cups you want. And that is the K-cup version of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Because the reality is that so many of these little plastic, non-recyclable cups have been used to make single cups of coffee, that there is a major environmental impact from them, right? And this impact was created by individuals using them to make individual cups of coffee, right? And if people hadn't bought into them to make all these single cups of coffee, then it wouldn't be an issue. And so, yes, every person does matter, right? And every person's impact, when combined with the impact of others, well, it grows exponentially, and it's a really big deal. We all have a part to play here, and we all can make things better. All hope is not lost, I promise you right? We, we can change the world. I, I say it all the time. And one person can't change the world alone, but when we all work together at the same time, we can, we can really make change. And I believe that whether it's with K-Cups or shopping at Timu or fighting fast fashion or anything else. So here is where I remind you yet again, that we are not here to win fights in the comments section. We will rarely change someone's mind just then in a way that makes us feel successful. It's one thing to say, hey, you should read more about this here or watch this video because it really made me understand this differently. I think that's a great way to handle it. It's another to confront someone or escalate into a back and forth with them, to call them a bad person or make them feel bad or kind of just go dark with them. That's, that's not going to help anything. And this often pushes them further away. We need to remember, we're just here to get people thinking, to hopefully get them interested in what we're talking about, get them interested in what we're doing. We want them to hang out with us, not hate us. So what can we do as members of the slow fashion community when we're confronted by something like there's no ethical consumption under capitalism? Well, one, we can be compassionate, not confrontational. We can show how we are making the most ethical choices we can within a very unethical system. Honestly, I think showing, not telling, is more impactful than just about anything we can do. Hey, I needed a new washing machine and I was going to buy a brand new one. But then I thought like, oh, wow, there are so many that just go to landfills or get dumped every year. Why don't I try a secondhand one first? And I went on Facebook Marketplace and I found one and here it is and I'm having the time of my life. Whatever it is, just show, not tell. Next, we can educate others about the true meaning of there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Hey, funny story. Do you know where it started? Do you know who said it first? Let me tell you about this t-shirt, what it really means, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do that in like a friendly way like I just did in this episode and not in a like, you know what? You're an idiot. Don't don't go that way, right? Just like, oh, wow, it's a really interesting story that people think, I don't know. I think a lot of people out there think that this like seriously came from Karl Marx or something. And really it just came from Tumblr? Like what the heck? That's so interesting, right? So that's the way you can start a conversation like that. 
Next, I think you can help others make more ethical decisions when there's an option in a helpful way. Going back to that K-Cups post, the person saying, hey, I actually got a French press and I can make coffee for one person just as easily as I could with a Keurig and it's not expensive and it tastes better. Like, there you go. You know, if you want, I can show you which one I bought or how I do it or give you a suggestion on coffee or a lesson about it or whatever. Like, just be nice because a lot of the information that we take for granted, other people don't have. There are tons of people who have never used a French press in their lives, but certainly have encountered K-cups in their office, at their parents' house, all kinds of places, right? And the last thing we can do is just keep up the good work. Keep up the work of spreading good vibes, of being kind, of trying your hardest, of making the best decisions that you can, but also being gentle on yourself when you can't. Sometimes we wait seven years to buy new underwear and we end up buying them from the gap and that's okay, you know? All right, well, that's all I have for you this week. Uh, I will see you all in just a few days. Once again, that's on Thursday, April 18th for episode 200. Um, that will be living on YouTube. We will also be releasing an audio version after that. It might need a little post-production from Dustin, but I'm hoping it will come out next Monday like normal. And then I'm going to take a couple weeks off because I am going to Tempe, Tempe, Arizona, which I always pronounce as Tempe first because Tempe is delicious. I'm going to Tempe, Arizona to speak at Eco Fashion Week with Fabric, all caps, F-A-B-R-I-C. I'm going to be talking to them about fast fashion and how the fashion industry could be better. And then I'm going to come back and I think I'm just going to spend some time Well, I'll be working, but also, you know, maybe reading some books, getting some sun, thinking about what I'm going to do next with Clothes Horse. So I'll be taking a couple of weeks off after that. Thanks for listening to another episode of Clothes Horse. Written, researched, edited, hosted, you know it all by now. It's all done by me, Amanda Lee McCarty. If you like what you're hearing, leave a rating, a review, subscribe, all those things you're supposed to do that I'm supposed to tell you. If you like to support my work financially, which I would greatly appreciate, I'm going to tell you. I did my taxes for last year, and I calculated that if I only worked 40 hours a week on Clothes Horse, which is is just like not true, I work way more than that on Clothes Horse, uh, I made $1.25 an hour last year. And long term, this is probably not like an, um, I don't know, like mentally, emotionally, physical, sustainable path for me to take. I'm able to live because I work full time seeing clients in addition I would really like to make the shift where I can cut that back a little bit so that Clothes Horse isn't this additional, like I'm working 12, 14, 16 hours a day kind of situation, but that will never happen if Clothes Horse can't bring in more money. So if you would like to support my work here, once again, if you can't, I get it, but if you can, there are many ways that you can do that. You can learn more in my Instagram bio and at my website and at patreon.com slash clothes horse podcast. Once again, if you can't support financially, that's totally fine. Listening, telling your friends, sharing my posts on Instagram, that all helps too. And I really appreciate it. And I see all of you who show up to show your support all the time. And trust me, it means so much to me. I'm aware of it and I appreciate it every day. Lastly, but not leastly, Thank you to Dustin Travis White for our music and audio support. And I will see you all in a few days at the live 200th episode extravaganza. Bye. (laughs) 